Good morning, everybody. Okay. Okay, I would start with a short introduction. I can still see people um, joining, but as we will be recording um, the webinar anyway, in case you miss something, you will be able to review it afterwards. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar series for founders and marketers in sports and health and, and wellness. Um, a very warm welcome on behalf of ISPO. My name is Christoph Rapp. I'm uh, the head of ISPO Brand New, responsible for our startup program. Um, today, our webinar uh, is accelerating your game, unlocking success in sports tech. And as you will see in our agenda, um, we have quite a number of very renowned and uh, expert guests today. So I will start with short introduction on what is ISPO brand new. Then uh, we have um, Oren, who's based in uh, Tel Aviv. He's the CEO of Colosseum, and uh, he will give us an overview of the current status quo of the sports tech market. And then we are very happy to have um, Alexander Will, who's um, the CEO of Improver, a very innovative sports tech startup, which is um, collaborating with um, the Zverev brothers. And um, obviously also very happy to have um, Misha Zverev, uh, being part of that webinar, who um, will, uh, during an interview with Daniel McDowell, talk about um, yeah, his perspective on, on sports tech, his perspective on um, using uh, Improver, and his perspective also on being an investor in different uh, startups. Um, and last but not least, of course, um, we also want to let you know on how you can become part of the biggest sports uh, startup program is for brand new and uh, sports tech nation, the conference happening um, uh, parallel to ISPO Munich. So again, a very warm welcome. Um, and let's start with a few numbers. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware about that, but um, nine of 10 startups actually fail and 30% of those already in the first year and only 1%, so one out of each uh, 100 reaches the 10 million revenue mark. That's impressive, even if uh, negative numbers. And that's also the reason why we at ISPO, and ISPO being um, one of the biggest sports business platform in the world, why we decided, okay, we need to do something to make startups more successfully um, and to support those startups in their way to um, become scale-ups and uh, yeah, bigger companies. So in line with our mission at ISPO to accelerate the global evolution of sports, um, we 20 years ago already founded uh, ISPO Brand New exactly to lead and help and guide startups through that um, challenging first year's um, in their business. So what is ISPO Brand New all about? Um, ISPO Brand New has its final, as I already said, at ISPO Munich. ISPO Munich is the biggest um, sports business event in the world. We have more than 60,000 visitors per year, um, more than 500 investors uh, are attending our program. Uh, startups uh, will have more than 20 speed dating meetings uh, during those two days. And of course, and that's one of the most important points, um, you as a ISPO brand new participant will have access to the global ISPO network. ISPO has been present in um, many international markets, Asia, China. Um, uh, we're just coming back from a conference we had in, in the Middle East. Um, so really um, a global sports business network. And apart from that, um, obviously, um, we can help you to also generate um, a significant media reach for your startup um, because uh, ispo.com being our media platform, our content hub, our online magazine generates um, millions of views during that two or three 
days. And if you are part of ISPO brand new, you will also have the chance if you go through the pre-qualification to pitch live on stage. And it's not uh, the usual startup pitch, it's founders fights we are doing. So there's always two startups battling um, each against the other. And then there is an overall winner who will be on our main stage um, during the final pitches um, and being able to receive that before mentioned significant media reach. And if you're lucky and you become one of our winners, maybe um, you will be able to go the same route some of the companies did, um, you can see here. So all of them uh, started with Espo Brand New and I'm pretty sure um, there are some familiar names like GoPro, Hawk, On, the running shoe company, um, Iron, Evoc. So a lot of those companies now being global international players um, started with uh, Ispo Brand New and have become very successful um, after that uh, support in the first years through Ispo Brand New. Um, but the question um, also is, and, and we know that tech plays um, a more and more important role in the, in the sports market. So more and more startups participating in Ispo Brand New have a sports tech background. So that's also the reason why today um, we decided to give you a short interview of yeah, how does the sports tech market actually look? What are the yeah, challenges, but what is also the future potential and who uh, could better talk about the sports tech market than Oren Simanian, who is the CEO and founder of Tel Aviv-based Colosseum. Oren, happy to have you here in today's webinar and looking very much forward to your overview of the sports tech market. Yeah, so thank you very much, Chris, and uh, happy to be here with you all. I have several screens, so I'm looking at you in, in, in some way, right? Um, it's a, it's a, so we have the presentation also of, uh, of STN here, uh, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in a way, when we say, uh, what sports tech for me, sports tech is, uh, is, uh, everything and, 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 uh, trying to explain, uh, what's everything it touched our life in different areas from doing sports to watching sports. And the question is to you, the audience, to think about what is actually sport and then connect it to tech because tech is an enabler. It's an enabler of everything. When we say agri-tech, fintech, and so on, the way to look at sport is, is, uh, uh, is to, to think what are the technologies that can support the sports industry to grow, whether you are an athlete or you sit at home at your sofa with a family, drinking your Coke, and you want to watch the game better, experience the game better. Maybe Alex will talk about it as well from that perspective. Um, let's skip the, to the next slide. The sports vertical that we are seeing and we are touching based on are uh, diverse. And it's very important to, like, to take a look at them because they're different from fan engagement, from esports health and fitness, media broadcasting, smart stadiums, digital asset, and other development. We see a huge, massive, I would say, growth in some of these verticals. And we see big difference in these verticals. But one thing that we see is that these verticals are becoming holistic. If I'm able to analyze the data of the player, the fans, the fans want to know it at home, how much you ran. And it's not only for the coach. It's not only for the athletics. It's not only for the MDs. People want to know and people want to follow. And there is a lot of data. So the question is how we get this data to be equivalent with a great user experience for the fans, right? How we can monetize this data, how we can grow in this industry. The ability to monetize the sports industry is not only betting, right? The ability to monetize is to create better experience. And this better experience with trust, with the ability to create confident for the fans at home that they are watching something that they trust that's on one hand and for the athletes that he's using the watch that actually gives him the accurate statistics and the accurate data when he runs so to take a look at these verticals each one of them by its own is significant but they are becoming holistic today 
You know, when I meet athletes that are doing, uh, they call themselves athletes, some will agree, some won't, but esports, right? They are practicing esports and in that way, they're saying we are stressed, we have back pain, we have hand pains. We're athletes like all others. We need physiotherapy, we need food, we need other things. So in that sense, take a look at these specific verticals. We see that it cut, it's catching so many technologies. Let's keep Talking about numbers, and I think the numbers are growing, but let's leave the statistics. The only thing I want you to take is not the number, but the mindset that the sports industry is growing. This is an insane industry. And in a way, in my opinion, if you analyze it right, it's bigger than the civil aerospace industry, right? Just to compare. We see sport in every move of our day, of our life. And every point there needs to be digitalized. Every point there can be disrupted, like Alex sure. And this is our move today. People that have passion for sports and people that have passion for technology, that's the place. And when we are talking about Sports Technation and Eastern Munich, to come to these events is to meet this triangle of capital, technology, and sports all together. So the sports industry is growing. There is an opportunity. We see the next events coming after Paris in LA, Olympics and World Cup, that's a place to grow into new challenges, into new technologies. <clears throat> Please, let's keep. This is a map that I created personally on my close ecosystem, right? It's a map from my close friends here. It's a very, very, very local community. I took a look at my friends here in Tel Aviv and I said, how many of you are tapping into the sports industry? And this is only in Tel Aviv. The global one is much bigger and the global one will share with you at the summit in December in Munich. But it just means that every corner around us, there are two types of technologies. There are the sports technologies that are dealing day to day with sports, and there are core technologies. <clears throat> core technologies are coming from agritech, from autotech, and they have an impact on the sports industry. So once you're looking around you, AR, VR are core technologies that are being implemented in sports now, right? And security is being implemented in sports. It's been implemented in so many areas. But now the sports industry is waiting for us to come and innovate. And there is a place because there is money. People are paying tickets to the top entertainment shows around the world to watch the best tennis players like we will hear today. And they are paying a decent amount of money. And the rights are rising. So people are asking, <clears throat> what are the opportunities to get into the sports industry? It's Red Ocean. No, it's not Red Ocean. It's a blue ocean to grow into. Women's sports is growing rapidly. AR is growing rapidly. VR is growing rapidly. AI in sports is growing rapidly. That's the place for you, like in any other industry, to take a look at opportunities. And this is a map that I've created in two months, just looking around on technologies that are active in sports industry. And then I said, okay, what's going on around me is actually a, world, a worldwide phenomena with rising companies that are disrupting or trying to disrupt the sports industry. Please. <clears throat> why sports from so many angles we love sports because sports is health it creates an educational phenomena its impact on the social people it creates communities it creates international relationships right on the sports technician as part of ispo there are going to be delegation from australia that are leading in sport performance delegation from india the biggest country by population in the world that would like to see and analyze how the future how the future community, the youth level, is going to tap into the sports industry, right? 1.5 billion people. There is going to be a delegation from Morocco that are now planning the biggest stadium in the world. Um, and more coming to tap into this world. I'm going to jump on that. Why sports? Because we touch every point of our life. So to save time, we'll skip. Jumping from that, I invite you all to join us in Munich. And I'm doing a one minute of why, right? Munich is a sports city and it's a very strong media city and sports plays a great place to me that connects geographically a lot of countries. As I said, and there are going to be delegations coming from Italy, from Spain, from Australia, from India, and so on, from Morocco, from Israel, and so on. And the idea is to create this meeting point for people that are on the triangle of capital investments, sport people, and tech people and to, to create an, the holistic partnership. Let's jump. <clears throat> Alex, before I pass the word to you, <laughs> which is okay, 
uh, I think that uh, you will hear Alexander, right? And Alexander brings to you what we are actually thinking about. The connection between capital that makes things available. Uh, capital is the, the enabler, right? The investments. But with the ability to bring sport knowledge and we brought, you know, top talents, top global, global talents that if they say this can work, this has an impact, we need to listen to them and see and follow, right? And we see more and more athletes getting into the game, more and more athletes getting into the field of sports tech. But we want to see these techies trying to understand that the world of sports tech is rising. There are capital, there are investment firms, there are family office, venture capital, angels that are crazy about sports. They are passionate about sports. You will meet them at the summit. You will see them. And they are willing to invest in something something that can create great economic financial benefits, but they're also part of the game. Not all of them are getting to be top talents, but if they have the ability to join forces with companies like uh, Alexander's one, it means a lot. So from that, I invite you all to come to Munich third and fourth. It's going to be a bit cold, but we're going to warm each other together. Thank you, Alex, to you. <laughs> okay, now over to... Alex, CEO of Improver, who will give us um, some insights in the daily life on the one side of a startup founder, challenges, successes, obstacles, and obviously we'll also talk about the innovative technology that's uh, behind Improver. Alex, over to you. I would share my presentation now. Markus, is it okay? Yes, sure. yes. Okay, I'm not able to start it. Okay, okay, hold on. Now it works, hold on. Okay, you see the chart? Okay, it works. It works. Hold on a second. Okay, hi. I'm Alexander Will, founder and CEO of Improver. Today I will briefly introduce you to Improver, but also to our hold on one second. Okay. Uh, to our corporate business uh, and planning for the future, spiced up with some few insights that I think are also quite interesting. Our brain directs and controls every move we make. Improver's revolutionary VR technology provides brain-based exercises that helps athletes to tap their hidden potential. They optimize their movements and lift their performance to unprecedented levels. What does Improver do? We unlock every athlete's full potential by providing scientific brain-based training through an easy to use mixed reality technology. It is well known that professionals are at their limits. They are kind of maxed out, but it's also well known that amateur athletes never reach their full potential. But why is it like that? Because there's one missing link. They do not use their brain skills. Athletic performance requires optimum movements. And it is our brain that controls every move we make. In order for us to move perfectly, these control processes need to work perfectly too. If they don't, we experience reduced performance, strain, and even injuries. Das war mir so nicht klar gewesen, dass mein Gehirn im Endeffekt alle meine Bewegung steuert. The science that studies this connection between our brain and body is called neuroathletic. 
Elite athletes are beginning to add brain-based training successfully into their routines. Aber für mich ist es einfach die Steuerung von deinem eigenen Körper. Du kannst Systeme steuern dadurch, die du halt mit Fitnesstraining und mit normalem Training einfach nicht machen kannst. Now, Improver brings neuroathletic training to the market featuring the latest VR technology. At the heart of peak athletic performance is balanced core stability. Only then, both sides of our body can work together perfectly and release its full potential. 90% of all movement-related information processed by our brain is visual. The optic nerves links directly to our brain, which is connected with all our muscle groups throughout our body. This makes visual apps the perfect exercises for pinpointing and enhancing our body's weak spots. Improver's brain-based VR training uses gamified visual exercises to target these specific areas of our body. Sensors track the movements and angles of our head, eyes, and body. Improver then uses this data to customize exercises for each athlete, refining their performance over time. Improver apps focus on four areas. Stability, like the example you saw. Power, precision, and scanning for peripheral perception. For example, tennis players improve the precision of their backswing and strokes. With this device, I won two Masters titles, I won six Turniers, the gold medal and the World Cup. And I was just before the number one in the world to be the number one in the world. Football players enhance their perception on the pitch and their passing accuracy. Three FA Cups here, 14, 15, 17, with Arsenal, as well as the WM title came at that time. So, Neuroathletic has really made me really good. VR brain-based training is highly effective and backed by sports science. Train like the world's top athletes with Improver. Markus, just a quick question. Uh, you see the full screen, right? I do, but I also see you guys. So I see okay, you at the same time. You see yeah, the I do. full screen of the presentation. Yeah, full yeah I do. That's All right. Image. That's yeah. okay. It's fine. So what is our performance formula? The most important pillar is the basis of the practical sports science here shown in the roof. The effectiveness of the exercises stand above all other issues. This is because the practical exercises have to be decoded into the digital environment of mixed reality. Then we have three further pillars we put together. First of all, the headset. With this device, athletes can train without any distraction, wherever and whenever they want, like anytime and anywhere. The second pillar is special data can be collected and processed in order to create new type of analysis. And the third one, the third pillar is we implemented gamified experiences with um, that increases excitement and uh, retention. Improver was able to engage two of the world's best scientists. First of all, Lars Lienhardt. He won the FIFA, or who won the FIFA World Cup with the German national team in 2014 and has worked with all the top performers there. And currently he's coaching many top footballers from the European leagues. But his clients also include many other world-class athletes and Olympic champions. And the second one is Horst Lutz, who was trusted by Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool to improve his players' performances with his coordination exercises called Life Kinetic. Both are also authors and have already marketed several books each. With a study we conducted with Dario Novak in Zagreb, we had the proof that a decoding practice oriented exercises into the digital environment works and has an enormous effect on the user. In 2022 and 2023, Improver invested a lot of time and money in the most important work, the effectiveness of the exercises. In 2024, so this year, we focused then on the issue of data capturing and processing, as well as the gamification. The combination 
of the upcoming eye tracking and AI will always give us the opportunity to stay one step ahead. It allows improver to measure and integrate real-time data, training data. But our vision, hold on, sorry, was too quick. But our vision is. Hi, I'm your improver. Welcome to your personalized training session where we improve your performance. A digital coach controlled by AI will constantly accompany the athlete in the application, guide him, shows him exactly what is being trained in his body and ultimately help him to, to perform better. We started with professional athletes. Through that, we gained a lot of experience, which has given us the insight that many of the uh, that many of the exercises, sorry, are also incredibly important for amateur athletes to be to be able to reach their full potential. So next year we will publish the application for amateurs. Here, just a brief overview from some more top athletes and well-known coaches who are looking at our options for improving performance. So some numbers. Here you can see the dynamic of our business model as we go through the transition from professional to amateur sport. The launch of the consumer app will be in the middle of next year. Below you can see we are currently in our pre-seed phase and are trying to find the right partner for the seed phase with our acquisitions. Our future marketing activities will be supported by the whole development of the entire headset market. In particular, the fur further developments of uh, Meta, it's Facebook, and Apple in 2025 to 2027 Will be, will be a mass market penetration, gonna be big. So some recommendation for startups, that's getting interesting. We have complied a list of recommendation for you based on our biggest challenges we have had to face in the past. Number one, always set up a flexible financial model. We have complied it out of uh, three areas. One is the A is revenues. Generate revenues from the beginning on that are aligned with the business strategy. This is important. B, grants. There are so many types and national of national and international funding opportunities. Use them. It's pretty easy. And C, investments. Try to convince early stage angel investor, in, investors right from the start and move on to pre-seed, seed, and so on. There are also a lot of good angel, agencies that can support uh, founders in that case. For example, we work with Economy in Berlin. The second part, think about to use the support of a company builder to reduce unnecessary overhead costs. Improver uses a company builder in, in particular to keep employee costs low. This model is called shared service. You can, all, you can only use the hours you actually need. Cash flow, yes. Minimum 15 to 18 months, not eight, not 10, not 12. Go at least with 15 months. This is very important to pursue this point consistently. And investors, the process is like a classic sales pipeline. The funnel must be always full. From early stage investor to series A, it has to be full. Okay, so thank you for your attention and a briefly on our own behalf, if you are interested in our business, just get in touch with us. We are open for further investments and partnerships. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Alex. Uh, very interesting insights into the world of a sports tech startup. And now I think everybody's excited uh, about hearing on how Misha transformed from a professional athlete into investor and partner of, of sports tech startups. So Daniel, I'm handing over to you. Hi, uh, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you, uh, Christoph and uh, Josie and Alex for uh, inviting me. Um, and I want to welcome Misha Zverev uh, to the panel. So welcome, Misha. Very, good very morning, nice to see everyone. you. Oh, good afternoon. Yeah, here it's uh, here in Tel Aviv. It's uh, noon. It's uh, twelve thirty. Uh, I guess over there it's uh, <laughs> it's still morning. So. Um, just uh, just a little, you know, recap to everyone. If anyone doesn't know who Misha Zverev uh, is, Misha, how about you? Say, is you're a former tennis player, uh, inactive I tennis just, player? I usually just say I'm the brother of Alexander Zverev. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like to you short said. up. Um, <laughs> and then the, the next question normally comes up and it's like, what, what does it mean? What do you do? So, uh and that, that becomes a bit more complicated. But uh, long story short, yeah, I used to play tennis all my life. Uh, I've been on tour for maybe 15 years. I was uh, ranked 25 in the world. Played against all the top guys at all the uh, top events and uh, got to travel a lot, meet a lot of people, um, get to know a lot of cultures and get in touch with a lot of different businesses. And that's why at one point I thought, okay, there's more to tennis um, than just being on the court. And um, that's why I decided to kind of transition a little bit into the uh, yeah startup world, I guess. So before we start the actual interview, I want to uh, ask you all in the audience if you have any questions for Misha. So you can leave, uh, leave them in the chat, uh, add your name and your email when you uh, leave the question. And in the end, if we have time, uh, we'll uh, ask some of the questions. So now uh, let's start, Misha. And, and you already started telling the story, but it's yeah. interesting for me to hear. Uh, after your retirement, what inspired you to shift, you know, from being a tennis player to investing in startups? Actually, um, it happened while I was still on tour. It happened in 2020 during COVID. And uh, as we all know, to in order to play tennis, we need sponsors, we need fans. And during COVID, that wasn't really possible. So I found myself in Florida um sitting at home training every day but i asked my question like what do i train for like no one knew like when is the tour going to resume am i going to play uh, in one two three five or six months again so i figured okay suddenly you find yourself in a position where you are humbled because no one really cares about tennis uh, no one really cares about um what you do when, when when there's a crisis when there's COVID. so i figured i need to find a way to make money. And at that time, um, I had the stock market and uh, my friend and, and also partner, we looked at startups and um, he, he's a very interesting person, bright, bright person. He told me, look, uh, he, he taught me a lot. And we started uh, looking at private companies, at startups and, and, and started to invest money because I figured, okay, so I have a family, I have a child, I have a wife. I need to make sure that I have something in the future that I invest my money and it's not just sitting there on a bank account. And that's how I actually started investing in companies. So do you think your experience as an athlete shaped your approach towards the startup world? Um, maybe. It's, it's hard to say because um, as an athlete or as a tennis player especially, you lose every week. So you're very familiar with losing. And and there is maybe over a thousand tennis players and only maybe like a hundred make money. So um, there's also a thousand coaches, but maybe hundred thousands of coaches, but most of them are useless. So that was pretty much my approach to startups. A, I'm uh, useless. I have no idea what I'm doing. But um, as a tennis player, what is important, you need to build a strong team. You need to build a team that you trust, that you rely on, um, that's honest uh, to you. So, and then I started building a little team. There was actually just uh, two people one is an algorithmic trader. He went from zero to having uh, an, an asset, a wealth of multiple billions. And the other guy was a young gentleman from Monaco who, who was an athlete and was pretty smart. So I was actually, those were my two mentors. And the other thing I knew is like, you work until you're tired. There's no nine to five. There's no like 10 to six. No, you work until you're tired. I would be sometimes waking up at four in the mornings, checking messages, getting on phone calls because I figured I need to work until... I feel comfortable in this area and I, I need to work all day long, every day. 
And in the back of my head, I need to understand that most of the things that we do, you're going to lose or they're going to fail. Like as we saw in the presentation earlier, um, only 1% of startups actually make 10 million in revenue. And that's the same in sports. The, the winner takes all methods, I feel like is, is very extreme in, in the startup world. And, and that I was, it was always clear to me. So I was very careful, but I understood I had to be better than everyone else, meaning I had to work better and I had to surround myself with the smartest pe pe people possible. So we, we said the word startups a lot, and we also said the word sports a lot, but we're talking about startups in sports. So what do you, Misha, what do you think are the main challenges in sports startups, you know, in this sport tech ec ecosystem? How, and how can people overcome them? Um, there's different sectors to me. There's a, the a startup that really helps a professional, like for example, improver that really changes your life or the way you perform on a pitch on a court. Then there's tech startups, which is made for the audience for the, uh, broader spectrum that, uh, says, look, we changed the way you experience sports. And, um, so it really depends what you're focusing on, but in the end, um, I feel like sports tech or sports sorry sports is um it's very important um because we live in the world where we have a lot of stress and sports helps you to release stress and we live in a world where well-being is also highly um everyone tries to live not only longer but live an active life so sports helps in that aspect too so i think you really need to understand who do you target and really need to understand how can i be different how can i make someone's life really really improve or change and then that's why i always i uh, was fascinated with actually my very first thought of was improver because i was struggling with a few things for many many years and you know you spend hours and hours on the court training but nothing really changes um your your performances you know sometimes great sometimes so so and uh, that's what that's why i tried brain uh, brain based training Sasha tried it, my brother, because he had some issues. He got actually stronger. He got bigger. So he ta his take back on the back end was a little bit more compact and shorter because he had more muscle. So he lost a little bit of his technique, of his feel. And we tried different things on the court. It didn't work out. And all of a sudden, we start with brain-based training with neuroathletics. And he says, like, look, I can finally get my feeling back. I can finally get my touch back and keep my power, keep my consistency. And then he goes on, wins literally the next tournament he plays after training and, uh, and then he's like okay that's it he he wins the gold medal he plays a couple of semis at the grand slams he becomes world champion and then he's like okay this was the missing puzzle that i needed because i've been playing tennis for 20 years but those things we've never tried it so i always say to people if you can change someone's life with your technology or you can change the ways people watch tennis or experience sports then you have a shot at it otherwise the the sector is just too crowded and too busy and and a lot of people try to do similar things and it's hard to really pick a winner so you mentioned what the goal is but let's get more into the specifics like where would you put your money you know in in sports tech is it the data or, or fan engagement ar vr performance let's go uh, with the if it's uh, for the professional athlete, it's something that they haven't tried. So it's actually two things. It's how do you increase your performance? So for example, VR, AR, brain-based training for me, that's, I love it. Um, how do you improve your recovery? Because everything else, we've been training for many, many years. We've been like spending thousands of hours. Nothing much has really changed. But like if you go into those details, like tech, sports tech, you can really improve someone's performance. And the other thing is, fan engagement how can i make someone's um experience at the at the stadium how, how can i make it nicer and better so anything related to fan experience is very important just data for example i'm not a huge fan of data because sometimes data alone doesn't do anything unless you know how to read it well and from my experience with tennis for example people that provide data sometimes have no idea about tennis and and we've been working with a lot of data companies that were providing data for my brother and and sometimes uh, I'll just tell your story they would give me data that says look if uh, your brother hits a forehand faster than let's say 70 miles an hour 15 centimeters or closer to the sideline the chances of winning the point are above 90 percent so basically they're saying if you hit the line you're going to win the point this is something i know 
and matches are not lost because of lack of data. So in the sports, like you really need to watch out. How do you, how do you structure that data that you provide to, to athletes and, and companies? So you need to be really smart. And then if somebody is able to give data, for example, like I always say, look, if you can bind together like laws of physics, biomechanics, and also the mental stress that a player can experience on the court, if you can bundle that data and provide it to an athlete, it's worth money. But otherwise, you need to be careful with AI, with the word AI, and then with, and with data alone. So you're talking AI, you're talking uh, physics. What do you see? Where do you see the future in, in sports tech? Where, where is it going? It's uh, the future is we always say like what we, we use. Um, I don't know how many percent of our strength, muscle, bones, ligaments. But I feel like when it comes to our brain, we use a very small percentage of the of the brain of the capabilities of our brain. We always say that we don't really fully understand how the brain works, if I'm not mistaken. So I feel like tapping into those potentials is super important how can you make your brain just work better more, more more efficiently faster how can you how can you get more out of it how can you like upgrade that system every time like you you, you give it a new software update and it works better like um because it's it's fascinating how as a child you can learn a language and then not have an accent and then as a grown-up you try to learn a language and there's no way you can speak without an accent you will always have that weird uh, german whatever french accent so i feel like if we can tap into that potential and just teach, for example, a grown up 45 years of age to learn Chinese and not speak without an accent or perform the most crazy stunts or, or things on the court. Um, because to me, tennis is, is like a language. If you don't start very young, you're going to have an accent, meaning you're going to have a flawed technique. I can tell you this person started very young. This person started when he was age 20 because his technique, if we say that's an amateur technique. So I think the most important is we need to figure out how we can make our brain perform better. So let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey. As we said, you started as an athlete, now you're an entrepreneur. What was the biggest surprise for you in this transition? Uh, there were, I mean, I can say there were many surprises and no surprises because um, I was open to anything. I didn't have a lot of experience. So I, anything that happened, um, was either a surprise or I could just be like, okay, this is normal. And when I started, it was 2020. We had COVID. The world was going nuts. Everybody, we had SPACs, SPVs. People were just investing money left and right. The, the stock market was going up and down. A um, couple of years later, we had a crisis. We had the, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. It's just so many things happened that everything was kind of new to me and everything was, was a surprise. But I think... Once I started to get to know more companies, more people, I started to pay attention more, not just to the product, like what are they trying to sell, but more to the people. Little things like um, how long does it take a CEO to order in a restaurant, for example? Um, like the, or the other, when, I'm, when I'm in a conversation and the other person is a GM or, or, or some marketing expert, and, like, and sometimes I'm surprised that like, he doesn't see, for example, the person doesn't see that I want to leave the conversation for the last 10 minutes because I have to go somewhere and they keep talking about themselves. So to <laughs> me, or like the human aspect that I'm surprised that like how many people do certain things that like I feel like they shouldn't be doing. And, and sometimes the product is great, but who the person who delivers it or the person who's in charge of, of the company is sometimes not the right person. And um, to me, I understood it's, it's the same with tennis. You need to build a team. You need to have a team that that works with you and it works well with you. You can have the best tennis coach in the world, but if he doesn't speak your language, he's not going to help you on court and, and doesn't have to be the best coach. It has to be someone you can trust. You can rely on or who, who can learn with you and, and work extra hours to, to make it. So let's talk about your day-to-day uh, -day life. You know, how involved are you in the startups you invest in? I, it depends. I, I see startups as children. You know, some, some need more attention, some need less attention. Some are very young and, and they, they need a lot of help and, and others are already grown ups. Uh, it, it really ma it depends because I, I try to, first of all, I try to invest in startups that I feel like I can help I, a little bit at least. And, and then it, it matters because we have times when, when I need to travel a lot to go to different conventions and get on phone calls and talk about strategy, talk about go to market, how do you do it, talk about potential investors. And then there's times when 
everything is kind of running smoothly. So it, it really it's hard to say because as a, as a main job, it's it's obviously I'm I'm a coach and an aide and manager of my brother. So my brother is like my main focus, but I always try to find time, whether it's in the middle of the night or on an airplane where I can think about, okay, there's certain startups. What can I do to, to make them succeed? Is it about networking? Is it about finding a, a distributor or whatever it is? So um, it, it really depends. It could be an hour a day to maybe 10 hours a day. So we're, uh, we're getting closer to the end of the interview, and then we'll go to the, to the audience's questions. Um, I do want to ask you if you have one key piece of advice for, for investors, for entrepreneurs, getting into the sports tech world? I think really get to know the company, the tech, the, 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 the product, whatever it is, get to know the people. Um, because I, I think it's very important. You also, you need to understand the sports and you need to understand the environment that, that we're in because every sport is unique. Every co country is unique in culture because Talking about tennis in, in Wimbledon in London is, is one thing. Talking about tennis in New York, Flushing Meadows, US Open, you have a totally different crowd. So I think it's very important to understand really the product, the, the, the customers, uh, and, and try to understand like how, how can you also help them? Maybe if it's just financial help, then um, what can you do to, to make them go big, to make them uh, become successful, have a revenue of 10 million, whatever it is. I think you need to do a lot of homework and um, there's, I think anything in life that you can't just go there and, and flip a coin and be like, okay, I'm going to do it. Yes, it's going to work. No, it's like, who cares? So I think there's a lot of work that's, that's required to be an investor or an entrepreneur. Misha, 10 years ago, I'm guessing that your dream was maybe winning a grand slam or something no. like that. <laughs> no, no. no. I think okay. I was so this one thing, I'm very rational. I knew I was never going to win a Grand Slam. So that's okay, an ATP 500. Okay, an ATP 500. Yeah. So 10 years ago, that was your dream. Yeah. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I hope I see myself in a position. Actually, my brother is maybe still on tour. So maybe I can travel to the nicest Grand Slams and tournaments around the world. So I see myself still being um, in the sports world. Uh, but I would love to be like like one of the Shark Tanks, you know? Um, I would love to be a person where if, if there is a young company, a startup or a tech company, sports tech company, that they'd be like, you know what? I would like to call Misha and, and see because maybe he can connect us to Adidas, Nike, Wilson, Head, whatever, or connect us to Wimbledon. So I want to be, you know, one, consider one of the tennis, first tennis uh, sharks out there. So that, that would be probably my dream. Misha, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll soon do the questions from the audience. First, we'll have Juzi uh, that will say a few things. But thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank joining you. Us, thank, thank you, Misha. Thank you, Daniel. Before we come to the questions, and I already can see a few questions in, in the chat, I'd like to hand over to Juzi, who will explain to you on how actually you can also become part of our startup program, This will Brand New. Hi. So, well, thanks, everyone, for uh, being there. Um, and startups out there, investors out there, uh, this is our um, um, idea on why should you be there at uh, ISPO Munich this year. Um, as Christoph was mentioning, this was the launch bed for big grants like On, Maloria, Crops. And they used to be startups. They used to be very small, but they had uh, this push. Um, as startups, what you can do, you can, on the one hand, be physically there and join ISPO in Munich, booking your booth. Applications are open. And at the other hand, if you apply, we have the chance to join the ISPO Brand New Award. Um, as Christian was, uh, Christoph was already saying, we will run through a pre-selection phase where Misha, among others, will be uh, um, among our honored jury members. And if you end up in the pre-selected uh, startups, you will be invited to live preach on stage during ISPO, where, as mentioned, there will be around 60,000 participants, 1,000 media journalists. So we, you will have the, sta the stage in all senses. Um, what you can do, uh, just go on our uh, website, ispo.com, 
and um, just register upon receiving your application for ESPO Brand New. We will provide you with all the details to apply for the ESPO Brand New Award. But also, I didn't mention that uh, during ESPO, there's a lot of uh, occasions to network. For example, you will have the uh, chance to join the elite networking night with uh, potential business partners, investors. And I'm calling also you investors out there if you are looking for sports tech startups sports generally um, startups, uh, please join us because we will also have uh, speed dating sessions to connect. Uh, the very same uh, with what um, happened with Misha uh, and Movementa, one of our past startups, to make the connection. We are ISPO, we are the platform to make you make your valuable connections and bring your business in the future. Um, if you have any questions on what you will receive and um, what will be included, uh, we will have um, the brochure delivered to you, um, but you really have uh, everything included. This is a small picture to have to provide you with an idea what a booth looks like. Um, you will have uh, even um, energy um, table lockers, logo print, uh, in, you will list it online in our catalog as well as uh, in our printed version. And um, if you need uh, uh, some more uh, special lines, I'm happy to tell you that Misha and Sasha will also be there at HISPO with us and we look forward to helping you to, get, to have your launch bed in the future. So I will now just remind you that ISPO brand new uh, applications will be open. Um, but if you also want to join the ISPO brand new award and so have your chance to join the pitches, please don't forget to apply because applications are open until the 1st of October. So um, now I would be happy to uh, for uh, Daniel to uh, take a look at the questions and let's um, see what Misha can tell us more. Thank you, thank you, uh, Josie. So uh, we have most of the questions are from Misha. I also noticed a few questions uh, for some of the other uh, panelists, so we'll try and uh, juggle. I don't know if we'll be able to reach all the questions because- I, uh, I will um, write down and take screenshots of all the questions, so I'll make sure I answer every single one of them. So that's, like, just- That's uh, fantastic. We don't have to read all of them, but I'll, I promise I'll make sure I reply to most of them. If That's I don't know, fantastic. I'm going to get research done and try to answer the best way possible. So good. So maybe we'll, that'll, be, that'll help us maybe focus on a few right now. So let's start uh, actually with the first one. Uh, Andre asked, uh, how important is it for you to know your mental abilities, strengths, and weaknesses? I think knowing your weaknesses is maybe more important than knowing your strengths because um, um if you're good at something, you don't really think about it a lot. But uh, I think understanding your weaknesses and, and fixing those, because whether it's a bridge or a team, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the same goes to your me mental ability or capability. So um, I think this is very, very important to I always say, no matter whether you're a young person trying to become a grown up, an athlete, uh, a business person, I think you need to understand yourself, get to know yourself. And then later on, be, be, be honest to yourself. And uh, that's why um, I, I think um, whether it's sports or business, if, if you really understand who you are and what your strengths are, and then you can work on your weaknesses, that's, that's the most important part because no one is perfect. And if you know you're not good at something, you need to be open and honest and say, look, I, I'm terrible. I need help, but I'm going to get the right person to help me. Here's an opportunity for you to be a, a shark. Uh, Holger asks you if you have any advice uh, for a company looking for an investor or partner in sports tech, where would you go to find one? It depends what the tech is. Um, it, it really depends because um, you can start with friends. If it's tennis, go to a local tennis club. It really needs you need to see like what problem are you solving? Who are you helping? And then you need to talk to those people because people want to relate. Um, because reason why we invested in Improver is because we could relate. We had a problem. We were trying to find a solution. We're trying to find answers with different coaches, different training. And all of a sudden, um, by accident, we, we meet Improver. And all of a sudden, we're like, okay, this is the missing piece that we were looking for. So 
I think um, people that can relate to a problem or solving a problem, they're the best people to invest uh, that that could invest. Okay, I'll I'll be skipping a few questions. As uh, Misha said before, he will answer everything uh, uh, yeah. afterward. A uh, question for Oren from uh, Olufemi. He asks, I want to know how important is the culture of a region? Uh, how, how much does that influence the use of adoption of sports tech innovation? Oren, you're mute. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't have smart things to say, but anyhow, I'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that the, it, it, it does a lot of impact, but, but it's important to say that sports tech is not, uh, is not in a place or, you know, you don't need to be Misha's very, uh, to be, to do sports tech, but you need Misha's very to support your sports tech journey. Um, in a way that the accreditation for most of the inventions around sports are coming from people that are the top leaders or the top leaders in sports, right? Uh, but the, the, the intention or the disruption can come from people like Alex, myself, Chris, many others that they see as fans, as athletes, as physicians, as MDs. They see that some of the things that they are dealing on the day to day don't work. They are broken and there is a way to fix them. So any individual, it doesn't really matter what's your background, where are you based, and when the world is very much flat uh, through uh, uh, the internet, there is a place to do things. I was in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa in January, right? And they are come to be, uh, they don't see themselves like that, but they are come to be the worldwide top leaders per capita in, in, uh, in uh, 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 achievement on athletic performance, right? They take the 10K, the 5K, usually, right? Uh, I like Gebe Selassie and many others. So I approached them and I said, you are one of the best runners in the world. Now, please think about areas that you can let other people improve and see how you guys are training, doing things, or what can be improved by the things that you are doing on a daily basis, because innovation and technology can come to you. So that you don't need to be a top athlete, but for sure you need people that surround you once you start the journey that will give you the best insights and the knowledge of how to raise money, the user experience of the users, how to get into the market. And uh, as Alex said, it's a long journey, right? So you need good people around you. I hope that it answered. Uh, I, I actually, I can also say the culture plays a big, big role. Uh, I, I always say because... German and Germans, for example, and Americans, to me, they're the biggest opposites. It starts with, uh, I like to say, Germans work Monday through Friday. So on Saturday, Sunday, they stay at home and they save money. And Americans work Monday through Friday. So on Saturday, Sunday, they go shopping and they, they spend as much as they can. So the, this, the culture, the way you approach <laughs> money spending, I think plays a huge role. And, and uh, I see it all the time. I deal with Japanese, Americans, Europeans and Australians and everyone you have to speak to them very, very differently because everyone is, is very, very different. But I think in the end, we all love sports and that's what connects us. The technology can be the same, the way your system should be different. So we'll have a final two questions. Let's start with uh, Ozgul question. Uh, question for Misha. Uh, what emerging trends are you most excited about in the sports tech industry? And where do you see the biggest investment opportunities in the next five to 10 years? Uh, so biggest investment opportunity to me, um, I think fans, we have more and more fans, more and more people like playing sports, joining sports because health, um, well-being, wellness, health is, is very important these days, uh, stress relief. So I think um, in that aspect, it's very, very important. Performance, if you look at um, athletes, high-performance athletes, um, there's two things that I always say is important is recovery. Recovery and uh, maximizing your performance uh, by whether it's brain-based training or just how can you maximize your performance. But if I would invest, I would always go, um, I would like to U.S. and just fan experience. Fan experience in the U.S. because the Americans like to spend money to them, sports is everything. They, the way they look at sports, the way they treat athletes, it's totally different from, I think, almost any nation. So I think that would be that would be the biggest trend to me. Yeah. 
Daniel, we got you back. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. I uh, my internet started to so many, so so many, so many questions of the internet. File. Yeah, yeah. The internet had had his uh, mind on his own. Uh, I'm trying to, I can't now. I can't see the questions anymore uh, because I lost the chat. But um, I remember what I wanted to ask. There was one last question meant for Alex. Is Alex still there? Yes, he is. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, now I see everything. Uh, so there was a question for Alex from Ilya. He asked, uh, what did you mean with 15 to 18 months of cash flow in your presentation? Okay, it didn't come through. <laughs> it is very important to have enough cash on your bank account for all the um, all the work you have to do. Um, everybody, the, the startups always forget, okay, I have to live with my capital a certain um, a certain timeline, and they start to uh, with uh, start to have money ready for six or seven months, and this is too short. You have to think in the longer way. Your cash runway has always to be at least fifteen months to to have a solid workflow and a stressful, a stressless uh, workflow. And uh, this is important um, to have always uh, a view on your cash runway. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think we'll. I will. I will maybe. I will maybe add to that that there are two terms that are important for the entrepreneurs: the burn rate is how much money you burn every month, and the runway, the run rate, how much you have to run, and and the have to run is not only for athletes; it's also for uh, entrepreneurs, as we know. Right. And sometimes as entrepreneurs, you just take money because you know, you think to yourself, okay, I'll, I'll have that and I'll manage. And then you burn equity and you burn money. Uh, but that's a very good point. Sorry, Daniel, yours. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, we'll finish the, the Q&A section uh, right now. I want to thank everyone uh, for taking part. Alex, uh, Misha, Ole, and Christoph, Juzi, everyone. Uh, and as Misha said, you'll be answering uh, the questions personally. Uh, right after this. So really, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks a lot, thank you. To everybody. Thank you. And we will share the recording as promised afterwards as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks, gentlemen and ladies.